Hello, dear colleagues. Welcome to the very first lecture of our Medical Aesthetics Training Series. This series is designed not only to share textbook knowledge, but to bring you clinical pearls, practical insights, and lessons learned through real-world experience. Our goal is to create the atmosphere of a private course, doctor to doctor, in which knowledge flows directly into clinical practice. Today, we begin with a comprehensive overview of botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin, often abbreviated as BNT, is one of the most fascinating and transformative agents in modern medicine and aesthetics. It has a very specific mechanism. It blocks the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, leading to temporary muscle relaxation. This highly targeted effect is the basis for its clinical usefulness. The toxin itself is produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. For therapeutic use, it is carefully purified and stabilized. When handled properly, botulinum toxin is not a dangerous poison, but rather a reliable tool that allows us to safely and predictably improve both medical conditions and aesthetic concerns. Subtypes of botulinum toxin. Seven antigenically distinct subtypes have been identified. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. The human nervous system is susceptible to types A, B, E, F, and G. Types C and D do not affect humans. Among these, type A is by far the most widely used in clinical practice, with type B occasionally used in certain situations. In aesthetic medicine, nearly all applications rely on type A. Mode of action. How does botulinum toxin work at the cellular level? At the neuromuscular junction, nerve endings release acetylcholine, which binds to receptors on the muscle, triggering contraction. Botulinum toxin blocks this process. Specifically, the toxin cleaves proteins that are essential for the release of acetylcholine, the snare complex. Without these proteins, the vesicles containing acetylcholine cannot fuse with the nerve terminal membrane. The result is that the neurotransmitter is not released and the muscle cannot contract. Clinically, the onset of action is usually observed within 48 to 72 hours. The peak effect appears after about one to two weeks and the duration of effect is typically three to six months. Antidote. A frequent question is whether there is an antidote. In theory, antitoxins exist, but once the toxin has bound to the nerve terminal, the effect is irreversible. This means that in our daily practice, there is no practical antidote. If too much toxin is delivered or if a complication occurs, management is supportive and we must wait for the effect to gradually wear off. Commercial preparations. Several different preparations of botulinum toxin are available on the market. The best known are Botox Disport, Xeomin Vistabel or Vistabex and type B preparations such as Neuroblock. Although they all contain botulinum toxin, their molecular structures, accessory proteins, diffusion characteristics, and clinical behaviors are not identical. In daily practice, the two most frequently used are Botox and Dysport. Units and conversion one of the most important points to remember is that dosage units are product specific. One unit of Botox is not equal to one unit of Dysport. The generally accepted conversion ratio is that one unit of Botox is approximately equal to 2.5 to 3 units of Dysport. This has significant implications for clinical practice. If we were to assume that the units are equivalent, we could either underdose or overdose a patient. Always refer to clinical data and established guidelines when converting doses between products. Off-label use. Officially, in most countries, Botulinum toxin is licensed for a limited number of indications, such as glabella frown lines. However, in practice, we use it in many more areas, the forehead, crow's feet, bunny lines on the nose, masseter hypertrophy, gummy smile, platysmal bands, and even in areas of the body outside the face. These are referred to as off-label uses. The responsibility lies with us as clinicians to inform our patients, to document that they understand, and to rely on the scientific evidence that supports these practices. New preparations. Research and development in this field is ongoing. Companies are producing new formulations, often claiming faster onset, longer duration, or reduced side effects. However, 
As clinicians, we must always evaluate these claims critically. New does not always mean better. Without randomized controlled trials, without large patient numbers, and without independent validation, we cannot simply accept marketing slogans as clinical truth. Evidence base. Compared to dermal fillers, botulinum toxin is supported by a much larger and stronger body of scientific evidence. Hundreds of randomized controlled trials and long-term studies confirm its efficacy and safety profile. This is one of the reasons why botulinum toxin has become such a cornerstone in aesthetic medicine. Efficacy and optimal dosage. So what is the optimal dose? For glabella frown lines, Studies consistently show that 20 units of Botox injected across five points provides effective and safe results. For Dysport, the recommended dose is around 50 units in line with the conversion ratio. In my own practice, I often find that 30 units of Dysport are sufficient for patients who receive treatment regularly, particularly when their main concern is not intense frown lines. For first-time patients, or for those with very strong corrugator muscles, I adjust the dose according to the strength of the muscle and the patient's aesthetic expectations. Repeated treatments. Another important question, how often should treatments be repeated? Literature suggests that, for Botox, the average reinjection interval is about 17 weeks. For Dysport, similar intervals are observed, with patients generally requiring treatment twice per year. In my own clinic, most patients naturally fall into a twice yearly rhythm, often aligned with seasonal routines. This keeps their appearance fresh and consistent without the feeling of being overtreated. Safety safety must always be addressed from both a short-term and a long-term perspective. Short-term safety. The most common complication is temporary eyelid ptosis. This usually results from unintended diffusion of the toxin into the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. The incidence in Botox trials ranges between 1 and 5%. With Dysport, the reported rates are lower. In almost all cases, the effect is mild and resolves spontaneously. Long-term safety. There has been some concern that repeated injections might reduce efficacy or increase risk. However, large cohort studies show that with correct technique and dosing, long-term treatment is very safe. Persistent ptosis or significant adverse events are extremely rare. Marketing versus evidence. We must remind ourselves that industry promotion is not the same as science. Whenever we evaluate a new product or claim, we should ask, was the trial randomized? Was it blinded? Was the number of patients large enough to be meaningful? Were the doses and dilutions clinically relevant? If the answer to these questions is yes, then we can place our trust in the data. If not, we must remain cautious. References. There are countless clinical studies and randomized controlled trials confirming the efficacy and safety of botulinum toxin A. In this video, I will not read every citation, but you can find selected references in the description below. Closing, dear colleagues. In this first lecture, we have covered a wide overview of botulinum toxin, its definition and subtypes, mechanism of action, available preparations, unit conversions, off-label use, new developments, the evidence base, optimal dosages, repeated treatments, safety, and the importance of critical appraisal of evidence. This series is not a simple textbook summary. It is a course-style transfer of knowledge from doctor to doctor, enriched with clinical insights and practical pearls that you can directly apply in your daily practice. If you found this video valuable, please subscribe to the channel and give it a like. This helps us to continue producing high-quality content and to reach more colleagues around the world. In the next lecture, we will discuss the history and medical evolution of botulinum toxin. See you in the next video.